My name is Carl Stitchen, and on behalf of the heads of the Committee of Heads of UK Law Schools and the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the first of a three first of a three-part series aimed at academics in law schools at all career stages. In these workshops, we aim to explore a range of issues related to academic career development, including the various career development tracks, university promotion processes, and the challenge for the discipline of law, managing expectations in relation to career progression, role modeling, management of succession planning, career development and well being, the law school as a business, and models of law school leadership, amongst many other topics, I'm sure. In today's workshop, we feature three university senior managers from the discipline of law. Throughout our presentations, our audience members may raise questions and comments in the Q&A function. After the presentations, I will attempt to moderate questions and comments, and you can continue to use the Q&A function throughout. I'd like to now I'd like now to welcome our chair for today's workshop, Deverell Capps, Dean of Leeds Law School at Leeds Beckett University. Over to you, Dev. Well, thank you very much indeed, Carl. And good evening, everybody. And if you're watching this on Catch Up, good morning, good afternoon, or good day. Uh, so today we are very fortunate to have a triumvirate, a trilogy, a trilogy, a, a triad of um, expertise from senior managers across the country, new universities and old. Um, this, of course, is a rescheduled event from our face-to-face -face session that was planned uh, at the University of Liverpool, uh, but had to be postponed because of lockdown one. And now, as we sort of edge towards lockdown two, we're lucky enough to be able to do this particular event virtually. Um, thank you very much indeed for the speakers who you've all come to listen to. You haven't come to listen to me. And so I shall, without further ado, introduce our first sage wise person today. So our first speaker this evening is the Executive Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Liverpool. She's a specialist in international and EU law and renowned for her expertise in EU social law and in particular gender equality and gender mainstreaming. Prior to being a PVC at Liverpool, she was the head of the School of Law and Social Justice and the research lead for the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences both at the University of Liverpool. Outside of academic life, our speaker is a non-executive director of Alder Hay Children's NHS Foundation Trust. So, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Fiona Beveridge. Thank you very much, Dev, for that introduction. And of course, I'm very sorry that we're not able to welcome you all in person to Liverpool. We were looking forward to introducing you to our fantastic city, but also showing off, if we're, if we're allowed to say that, our fantastic new School of Law and Social Justice. It opened in January. It was a £25 million investment. It's an amazing building, and we hope that at some time in the future you will all be able to come and visit it. So I've been asked to talk about you know, how I ended up with that title that Dev just um, read out, Executive Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. It's really quite a mouthful. Um, so I started out like I think a lot of people just getting the research bug as an undergraduate and therefore went on to um, a research degree um, without really understanding, in my case, um, very much about why anyone would do a research degree other than because they love to research and not really understanding very much about roots into academia. So, um, um, it was quite a long time ago, um, so this might surprise you. Um, my second degree was at the University of Nottingham, and there were two research students in the whole of the law school at that point. And the other one got a job as a lecturer in another university. And I thought kind of, oh, is that what you do when you've got a research degree then? You go and get a job. Um, and so, you know, I had a go at that, applied for two or three jobs and got one. Um, and I still didn't really, I don't think, know very much about what it would entail. I knew I'd be asked to do some teaching and some research, but had no real long term sense of what a career in academe would be. And that will be a bit of a theme um, of what I'm going to say today, because I think what I did throughout my career was just kind of do the thing that was ahead of me 
When I arrived in my first job, which was at University of East Anglia, I remember somebody saying to me, one of my colleagues, when I'd only been there, you know, a matter of weeks, so Fiona, what's the game plan? And I found the question quite absurd and terrifying, a game plan. I've only just arrived, it's my first job, I'm looking forward to my first pay packet. And you tell me I'm supposed to have a game plan for this. Um, and I, I can absolutely assure you that I never had a game plan. Um, I, I, don't, I think I still don't have a game plan, you know. Um, my first job was um, a temporary appointment. Um, we sometimes think there was a golden age where everybody had tenure and, you know, temporary appointments didn't exist. My first appointment was a three-year appointment. I moved from East Anglia to Hull on another temporary appointment for another three years. Um, gained permanent, permanency while I was there, but moved for, you know, personal and professional reasons to Liverpool. Um, um, after four years in Hull and arrived in Liverpool in 1992. Um, so I've actually been here in the same institution for a very long time. And, you know, I think sometimes people think that you have to move around or that you don't have to move around. I, I don't think it particularly matters which of those things you do. What I can say is that there is nothing in the job I do today that is the same um, as was in the job when I first came to Liverpool. So I came as a lecturer and my life was therefore occupied with teaching and research and the various administrative and leadership roles that I took on at different times. And I think, um, you know, I did more or less all of them, admissions, research lead, um, um, you know, leading up a research unit, um, being the senior tutor, um, chairing boards of examiners, all the things that you do um, um, to help to deliver the business um, of, of a law school. And, and over time, I progressed um, through the, the different promotion stages. And I think I was just always someone who wanted things to work well for, my, you know, for myself for the students and for colleagues. And so when there were jobs to be done, I was happy to take them on. I was happy to do the best job that I could. And so eventually um, I became the head of department. Um, and, and then when we moved to multidisciplinary schools, I became the first head of what's now the School of Law and Social Justice. Um, that's that's a post that at Liverpool we'd now call a dean um, post. So um, so there was never a plan. There was always just a kind of willingness to roll up sleeves and get on with things that needed to be done. And I guess um, there must have been some recognition in others that I was um, doing a good enough job to be to to be offered um, um, the next level. So. Um, What's different now? Um, well, as I say, my job now includes nothing that it did at the beginning. So the teaching tailed off um, once I became a dean and the research tailed off more gradually. Um, I still um, did some research, had some PGR supervision, for example, but eventually all my existing PGR students graduated. And of course, when you're in more of a, a leadership role, you don't attract new PGR students. And, and so, now, so now I don't do any teaching and I don't do any research. Um, so a typical day for me now would include some big set piece meetings. So my own faculty management team meetings, the senior leadership team meetings, a council or a senate, um, those kinds of things. Um, it would potentially include the one-to-ones with my, with my team um, that are a regular feature of my diary. Um, part of my role obviously entails meeting with stakeholders um, of the university. So today, for example, that happened to be a meeting with um, a woman called Tracy Gore, who is leading the Liverpool City Task Force on Race Equality. I'm leading the university work on race equality. So we were meeting to compare notes and work out where we'd be working together in the future. 
Um, it, there's also an element, because I'm a Pro Vice Chancellor, I'm a member of the senior team of sector engagement. So there's also been a Russell Group meeting today. Um, and there's been, um, as in every day, um, a, a fair amount of email. And um, given, given the day that it is with sector announcements, trying to make sense of you know, what we're now being asked to do, what, what, our, what our new testing regime that you may have heard about in Liverpool is going to entail for the university, all those sorts of things. So it's never a dull day on email, is there? So I would say that perhaps my days are slightly more predictable now than they were when I was either a head of department or a dean. So when you're a head of a department or a dean, you are so directly involved in solving the everyday problems of your colleagues and students that you never really quite know when you come into work in the morning what you're going to be dealing with in that particular day. You will have certain things in your diary that you expect to be dealing with, but I think in those very, very sort of colleague facing and student facing roles, there's always something that comes in um, where at the end of the day, you can just say, well, I really didn't expect to have to deal with that today. And it can be anything. Trust me, it can be anything from um, a, 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 a colleague having a, a, a difficult personal problem that requires you to take some action um, to, to, to help them to somebody reporting that there's a dead seagull outside their window um, or, or something like that. And somehow you're expected to deal with that as well. Um, so I was thinking, you know, what, what would be my advice um, to, to people? Uh, well, it, I mean, you, you know, don't think you have to have a game plan. Um, leadership comes in all shapes. Um, it takes place at all levels. Um, um, so I would say, you know, try to keep a balanced profile. Don't get too precious about it having to be, you know, all research, all teaching, um, all leadership. Most people do a bit of both. It swings around a little bit over your career. Sometimes you have very research focused periods. Sometimes you get pulled off into leadership roles that take up a lot of time. Um, in the long run, all of those things develop skills and networks that are mutually reinforcing. Um, and it doesn't really matter if, if you spend a bit more time on one rather than other um, for, for a period. I would say lead from the middle. Um, so you can always make things better where you are. Um, it might just be re re completely revamping a module or the delivery of a, year's, a, a year group of teaching. It might be fixing something, you know, that's kind of quite small and technical, but that just makes everybody's lives easier um, around you. Um, it might be that you're going to take responsibility for revamping a policy that you think isn't working at all. You can do all of these things without being asked to do them or appointed to do them. Um, and most of leadership in universities is about influence. It's not about being in a position of authority or an appointed leadership role. So lead from the middle where you are, those influencing skills are massively important um, in so many aspects of life. Um, and, and you develop them just by fixing the things around you and making life better for the people around you. Um, and, you know, talk about using influence. Sometimes people think that's a little bit delicate because maybe they think there's somebody in, in an appointed position who should be doing that job, making that thing better, and they're not doing it. So sometimes what tempts you, I think, to roll your sleeves up is that you think you can do better than the person who you think perhaps should be doing it. And I think that's something that we shouldn't worry about too much. Um, there's probably a good reason why that person hasn't got around to it. And if basically what you're saying when you roll your sleeves up is, look, I think I can see an issue here and I think I can help you with it, then in my experience, those kind of offers of help are almost always gratefully received. Almost always. There are some fragile egos around who would feel a bit challenged by somebody saying, can I help you with that? But it's not, that's not a typical experience, I don't think. Um, what else? Um, Taking opportunities um, to develop networks, you know, um, uh, and opportunities like this to actually think about leadership and talk about leadership, I think are really, really important. Um, 
you know, most people don't um, start their career saying, I'm going to be a leader one day. Most people discover, perhaps accidentally, perhaps through a bit of trial and error, that they're quite good at it um, and, and that there's, there's a way forward for them there if that's what they want to do. Um, it's fantastic that this event is really focusing on that for people in law. But I would say try to do that in a multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary way as much as possible as well. One thing that I think is really important is to avoid culture traps. And universities are full of culture traps. So let me, let me give a couple of examples to finish with. First of all, we talk about identifying good practice often. We do this all the time, don't we? Particularly around teaching. Um, um, we'll find some good practice, we'll learn from others. But in reality, my observation, um, and I look after in total about 25 academic departments, in reality, departments constantly reinvent the wheel rather than really get their heads up and with an open mind, go and find out who does it well uh, and who can help them quickly and effectively to develop a solution that will work for them. So, um, I, I, I think, yeah, getting those networks in place that really help you to be able to go and genuinely talk to other people about how they face what are almost always very similar problems that can be fixed in very similar ways. Um, secondly, um, I think try to avoid the culture of exceptionalism. Every discipline thinks it's different and special and can only do things a particular way because that's the only thing that works for them. Um, and I can assure you that every single discipline I've ever encountered has their own version of exceptionalism and why the rule that works for everyone else or the system that works for everyone else simply won't work for them. So try to gain that way of looking more objectively at the practice and culture of your own school, department, um, wherever it is you're based, and see it from the outside in. It's really hard to do. So sometimes it's about asking someone else to tell you what they see when they look and listening to them. In order to do these things, um, to really avoid reinventing the wheel um, and to um, avoid the culture of exceptionalism, you do have to build networks and accept invitations, you know, go and sit on other people's subject review panels, sit on their interview panels, join working groups across your faculty and just be really open minded to the possibility that you might learn from other disciplines, um, from other universities and indeed from other kinds of organisations outside the university sector that you might sit on. So some of the outside um, organisations that, that I've been um, part, part of um, have taught me more than simply staying within the university system. Um, and obviously I say that as someone who's actually never left university. So thank you. Fiona, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, as there are some questions, there's a question bar on the side. So if you would like to ask your questions, folks, feel free to put them on that particular um, question and answer chat bar, and then we will come to them at the end of the session. So uh, thank you, Fiona. Moving on to our second speaker this evening, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Social Science at the University of Lincoln. He tries uh, to continue to be research active. And were he on Mastermind, his specialist questions would be on international environmental law and more general questions on public international law. He started his career at the University of Reading with Carl Stitchin, no less, um, and then moved in 2002 to the University of Sheffield, where he was promoted to senior lecturer, then reader, and finally professor, leaving in 2012 as the deputy head of school. He was head of Lincoln Law School between 2012 and 2018 before taking on his new role. As a figure in the global debate on sustainable development, he was co-rapporteur for 10 years between 2002 and 2012 of the International Law Association Committee on International Law on Sustainable Development, as well as the chairman of the study group on international law and due diligence between 2012 and 2016. 
His latest work coming out in February uh, is co-edited uh, is the Law, Governance and Planetary Boundaries with Edvard Elgar. Our second speaker has four teenage children and since lockdown has redeveloped a passion for hill walking and developed a new obsession with iPhone photography. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Duncan French. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks, Dav. And first, uh, thanks, uh, Carl, for organising this. And also, Fiona, uh, I was reading and ticking off when you were saying things, so I'm not actually got sure. I've got an awful lot left, so a lot of the skills uh, I'm going to sort of uh, work around rather than sort of repeat, if I can. Um, so I'm going to start by just giving you a couple of anecdotes. So I asked uh, Lucinda, who's my executive assistant, whether she thought lawyers made good higher education managers. Her response was, ha, huh, well, just look around at the non-lawyers, enough said. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, I think we need to, uh, within the safe space of a lawyer's conversation, we can decide whether lawyers actually do make good higher education managers or not. And as Fiona said, it's been a rather busy day. We've had some interesting instructions from the minister, from uh, government. And uh, back in August, I uh, had organised a whole college question and answer event. And uh, it got to two o'clock and I thought, I really don't want to do this. I mean, poor timing, but you just plough through, you answer the questions and you sort of keep your head up and try to. And I think leading from the middle is exactly right. It's like you need to take your colleagues with you going forward. So let me try and give you a bit of summary of me and maybe it sort of fits and supplements some of the things that Fiona said as well. So uh, it, I think this has been a great opportunity because it's allowed me to reflect on some of the things that I've done, some of the things I forgot about and some of the things which actually reflecting on it has helped me over the years. So just to give you a taste of some of the roles that I've done over the years. Um, I've been Erasmus coordinator, I was director of the LLM, um, I was director of student welfare, so the senior tutor, uh, director of assessments, uh, I was a research centre lead. Um, but equally, thinking about it, some of the things I did outside of the school were each equally interesting and important. So I, I chaired the university student disciplinary committee which was eye-opening to say the least. Uh, lawyers always get asked to be on the academic appeals, the grievances, the review panels. And I think Fiona's point about um, we're not exceptional, there isn't exceptionalism and we need to engage with colleagues from across the university. Those opportunities are really great for that. So you start to build up a network of colleagues in that area. Apologies if my emails keep pinging. Uh, I still haven't quite worked out the technology after seven, eight months. Um, before becoming Pro Vice Chancellor here at Lincoln, I was head of school. Uh, I was also uh, took on the, a separate role as Dean for postgraduate students. Um, and I also chaired the he head of schools committee, which is where the heads of schools got together and basically aired our grievances and tried to sort of act as a bit of a semi-official trade union to sort of work with support and just slightly plague the senior management. But why do any of these roles? So obviously we've got some very obvious ones in the uh, head of school PVC, but there's also many of those other minor roles. Why well, choose actually actively to go after them, get them, take them on? And I think I probably got four reasons and I think they do supplement a lot of what Fiona was saying. Uh, firstly, I always enjoyed a balanced day. I always liked a real mix of activities. I probably have a short attention span. I like the mix of research, teaching and administration. And over a course of a week, that's what kept me interested. Um, I often saw problems. I often saw uh, things which were getting in the way, bureaucracy, and I, I wanted to be involved in the solutions, the sort of problem solving. Um, thirdly, and this is a point which I'll come back to several times, I like working with professional service colleagues. I like my academic colleagues, but actually I like working across the university as a whole. And there's definitely something, um, the one thing that winds me up more than anything are those academics who are very aloof with the professional services. And for me, that's a, a non-starter. And uh, as I said to somebody the other day who was rude to uh, my executive assistant, there is no bigger no-no than people being rude to uh, our professional service colleagues. And I like working outside the discipline. I like getting to know colleagues from outside law. Um, 
thinking about all the roles I've done, I think there are probably two big shifts. One is moving from deputy head of school to head of school, and one was moving from head of school to PBC, uh, even though there were other shifts over the years. And I think the deputy head of school to head of school was really about, God, I'm in charge now. I'm the respond- one responsible. I'm the one that the, uh, the dean, the PBC, the VC will come knocking on the door if something goes wrong. I need to have a, a real sense of what's going on in terms of learning and teaching in relation to that individual student case, in relation to research. The head of, I did a lot of that as deputy head, but obviously it was under the guise, under the cover of a head of school. And then moving from head of school to PBC, you suddenly realise, um, God, law's so simple. So I'm a PVC now in a college which includes uh, nursing and midwifery and paramedic science. I've got psychology. I've got uh, education. I've got sports and exercise science. I've got politics, sociology. And that mix of disciplines, particularly those which have got some PSRB and accreditation issues, and you suddenly realize, you know, we have our complications in law, but they're nothing compared to some of those other uh, experiential di- uh, disciplines. As a PVC, like Fiona, I sit uh, both head of college and I also sit on the senior management team. And it does put you in a very interesting Janus facing position where you're both uh, uh, looking outwards, making sure that the university is financially sustainable, that you're looking at the external relationship. You're dealing with the issues that are coming in, particularly from the OFS, the regulator, etc. But also you're having to take your college with you. You're going to have to go back and explain why you've decided certain things. And that can be quite a challenging position to be in. So why did I volunteer to take, you know, apply for these roles and take them on? I think it, I like new challenges. Um, I have liked and I continue to want to do research, but I think I realized relatively early on that I wasn't the world's best researcher. I didn't want to just do teaching and research. So there was a certain element of research fatigue. I think. And this role has allowed me to get the better balance that I personally wanted in that. And I just actually like it. I like, you know, I must be one of those nerdy people who quite likes the management side of it. Uh, So day job. Um, Yeah, well, it's interesting, isn't it? So I was, (laughs) it's, you know, sorting out staffing, resource, budgets, uh, strategy, driving change, seeking improvements. And that's in many ways all the positive side of things. If you wanted to put that on its head, it's uh, being held against and trying to meet targets, being set and trying to uh, strive towards key performance indicators, always recognizing that you're part of a cog in the wheel, that uh, sort of alternative analogy, it's uh, fleas on fleas. So I get told what to do and sometimes I just have to pass that message down. There is a real sense of sometimes of being a mailbox manager, I think, at universities that we need to try to avoid, and lots and lots and lots of meetings and committees, uh, both within your own uh, structure and also uh, at the university and externally. And I think what Fiona said about there are certain set big committee structures and then those more ad hoc ones and the number of repetitive frequent one-to-ones, which are actually some of the most important. So for me, I think there are two key aspects really. One is the supporting the heads of school, who I still think heads of school have probably got one of the worst jobs in a university. Uh, And I very much see my role as providing them with the the leadership and support to be able to do their role effectively. And there is always a firefighting function. So today has definitely been a sort of firefighting day uh, in many respects. I don't know whether one should say this, uh, but um, I definitely over the last two years as PBC have been epitomizing the fake it till you make it type of mentality. So I had to learn very quickly about the NHS, the NHS uh, educational structure, how we are nurses, the apprenticeships, things that as lawyers, we just don't, you know, don't come across our desk in law schools. Um, We run a multi, uh, you know, a teacher training with our skip partners, school centre teacher training. And again, knew nothing about it. And then I was expected to be able to, to lead on that with my head of uh, the School of Education, communicate that uh, to the senior team. Uh, psychology have a wonderful compulsory staff student ratio, which lawyers would love to have, uh, trying to do battle with both uh, the university to ensure we maintain our staff student ratio and then challenge the school when they try and take it too far is interesting. And we've just introduced a new um, 
degree in sports therapy. Well, uh, me getting to grips with the accreditation of that has also been quite interesting. Um, so lots to um, unpick. And I think COVID's been really interesting. And I'm going to apologise for talking about this. So very early on, um, our nursing uh, department were asked to um, essentially hand back our training nurses, our final year training nurses, back into the sector. Um, that was happening at a rate of knots. The head of school was in very close contact with the NHS and Health Education England. I was acting in many ways as a translator between the, the school and the senior leadership team where we're in incident, incident management uh, status. And that translating role of expertise into layman's language, particularly for my deputy vice chancellors who weren't quite sure what was going on, was a, a really interesting period and certainly taught me an awful lot of skills. So let me try and, like Fiona, try to wrap it up a bit. Um, so firstly, um, your PA, your executive assistant, is absolutely your best friend. Uh, you know, the uh, wouldn't be able to work. It is definitely a team effort in being able to, to move forward. Uh, I very much see my role as providing my heads of school with a safe space, but it's a critical safe space. You know, I will be protective of them externally, but they also know that they are going to have some difficult questions as and when we're required. Build up good relationships with your senior leadership team colleagues, particularly your directors of finance, directors of policy, those type of relationships, and particularly HR. I've always ensured that I've fully understood and fully uh, got on with my HR director. Um, and it's, I think it's about clarity of expression as well. So we spend so long writing emails, communicating by emails, very little done face to face and certainly over the last several months. And maybe this is something that lawyers do bring to the table a bit. Our use of language, our ability to explain something. Um, and it, there may be something there which we do uh, benefit from. So a lot of the skills that uh, Fiona's mentioned, I, I'm not going to, uh, talk about again. I think for me, there is a definitely uh, key issues around networking, uh, around active listening, about emotional intelligence to be able to understand why people are coming at things from a certain perspective. Um, as some may know, I asked on Twitter the other day, you know, what skills do uh, lawyers bring to higher education management? And I got a couple of replies and I thought I'd just share with them. So organization and logical thought, the, pre uh, the appreciation of potential, but also the limits of regulation. And certainly I've been known to bend regulations when it seems uh, fit. Uh, negotiation and compromise. And then a slight negative one or a more one to think about, worries about numeracy. And I have to say, getting in my head around spreadsheets has, has over the years been probably my greatest challenge. So I think that's, uh, that's true. So uh, why do it? I think it has to be because you enjoy it. It has to be because you can see you can add something to it. Um, I do very little teaching like Fiona. I do about two sessions a year. I have one, one and a half uh, PhD students and I try and do a little bit of research. But over the years, it's getting that balance right. And whilst I want to keep my hand in, actually, does, it, does the students a disservice? Because I was finding when I was ahead of school, I was having to cancel lots of teaching because I was having to rearrange it because the VC called me into a meeting. So actually, it's an acceptance that your role has changed, even though you're within the same organization. And like Fiona, I've never left the sector. So uh, same sector, different roles. Thanks, Ev. Thank you very much indeed, Duncan. Um, it's nice to know that everyone is on the same page, certainly. OK, then. So um, the last speaker in our trilogy this evening is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Hertfordshire. His background is in law, criminology and socio-legal studies, and he has particular interest in human rights law and public health, and specifically the impact of criminal laws and enforcement practices on HIV prevention, on the lives of those who live with HIV and those who belong to at-risk populations. He is a barrister, and whilst he does not practice, he is a bencher of the Honourable Society of the Middle Temple and sits on their Education and Training Committee. He is also a Fellow of the, of the Academy of Social Sciences. Prior to being the DVC at Hearts, he was the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, where he was Professor of Law and Society. And before Portsmouth, he worked at the University of Oxford, 
Kiel, the Open University, and was one of the founding members of the School of Law at Birkbeck in the University of London. Outside of law, our final speaker this evening has a passion for fiction writing. He holds an MA in creative writing and is also an active member of a writing group. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Matthew Weird. Thank you very much, Dev. Just listening to that makes me feel really tired. <laughs> Thank you for the. I, yeah, when you when you summarise it like that, it, it does. It, I just think, well, where, where did I find the time? Actually, um, yeah, it has been so fascinating. Thank you, Dev. Thanks, Carl. Thanks to ILS and um, uh, for for, for organising this. I, I'm really pleased to be part of it. And really interesting idea. And like Duncan, I. Uh, it caused me to reflect, which is always a very, very good thing, on how did I end up here? Because I do think one of the themes that I've noticed among colleagues who are at this kind of level or approaching this kind of level is quite often a sense of ending up. Um, rather, like, like Fiona said, you know, the idea that you would ever, when you go into your first academic job, think, oh, I'm going to be a deputy vice chancellor at, at a university. It's just, it's inconceivable um, that that is something that you could even think of, partly because, you know, universities don't have typically particularly structured career plans for their, for, for staff. And, you know, it's a bit, um, it's a bit magpie-like, you sort of move between things and things stick um, and then you hold on to them for a bit and they add up to something else and then you move a bit. And, you know, I think going, uh, I'm sure the questions are going to be really interesting. So I'm going to be, try and be relatively brief, but to follow the same kind of format as Duncan and Fiona. Um, her, my background, yes. So as, as Dev said, I did law as an undergraduate and like, like Fiona said, at the end of my final year, I got the kind of research bug wonderful, wonderful, as we all have, um, amazing inspirational teacher in my final year who said, oh, you should stay on and do a master's degree. And I had an aunt called Vera who died. Um, and it's the only money I've ever been left. And I was left £2,000 in a will. Um, never had it again. And my brother and I both got um, this £2,000. He spent his on a Scirocco GTI and I spent it on an MPhil. And I've still got the MPhil. That's all I think about higher education. He has not got that car. Um, I think he had probably had more fun um, with, with his using his inheritance, but I certainly got an extraordinary experience. And then we're going back a long way now, and my experience will be very different from many of yours now, depending on where you are. I got my first academic job, which was as a, as a full time research assistant at the Centre for Socio Legal Studies in Oxford, on the strength of an MPhil. No publications, no doctorate, you know. This is going back into the mid 1980s and it just ain't like that anymore. And, and so, in a sense, I'm a bit of a dinosaur and I'm very, very mindful and, and talking to earlier career academic colleagues that the challenges that they have and the experiences that they have and how they have entered into higher education are very different from my own. And I think one of the things about leadership and management as you move up this pyramid is to always be open to remembering the experience of the people um, around you it's very easy to feel um to be isolated not not purposefully actually it, it's an incredibly busy incredibly intense job um uh and i make no excuses for it I, I i chose it this is a choice but it is very easy to feel separated from those experiences and, and that those lines of communication active listening but also finding out what it is that's going on on the, on the chalk face, understanding earlier career academics experience is, is very important. Um, so the journey um, was relatively conventional in some ways. So I, I did that research assistant job, became a research associate, and then moved from that because I was on a fixed term contract there, moved to set up the law school at Birkbeck at the University of London uh, in 1992. And that was a wonderful period. And I stayed there until 1999. Then I uh, decided that I'd spent quite a long time teaching law and didn't know what it was like to be a lawyer. So one of the things about Birkbeck was we were teaching in the evening between six and nine, and that meant that I had a little bit of time during the day. So I did the bar course while I was teaching, um, qualified, and then uh, started pupillage. And within about three months, realised I'd rather eat my own eyeballs than be a barrister. Um, I met I had a particularly challenging experience in the chambers I went to which I won't go into it was a it was a, it was a complicated time and then I went in 2000 to join the 
uh, in the spring of 2000 to the Open University where I worked for four years um, with Gary Slapper, um, uh, much missed, um, a very dear colleague of mine who died a couple of years ago now. And uh, Gary, uh, and I know Carol's on this call, I think I saw her on the list, so um, uh, very rude to say this, but hello Carol from the Open University days. Um, so then I worked there, I was very happy, um, but for, for various reasons, it didn't really work out for me. I found the uh, Open University experience of not, not being um, you know, in, in an environment, as I understood a, uh, a university to be, wasn't, wasn't working for me. And I moved to Kiel, um, to Kiel um, and sort of didn't quite cross with Carl, but there are lots of intersections here as I look, as I look through my, my career. Um, I stayed there for uh, three years and then I moved back to Birkbeck. Um, and this is very important as a senior lecturer then, in, in, a, in a faculty of Birkbeck that doesn't exist now, not back to the law school, in the uh, continuing education department. And I think the reason I mention that is that I didn't become, a, I became a senior lecturer in 2007 and I'd started my academic career in 1986. It was 19 years before I became an SL. Um, and I think I had a kind of long game view about this. I felt that you know, to be a professor, one needed to be old. <laughs> I don't know what I meant by old when I was 22. But I felt I needed to, you know, you needed to be at least in your mid late forties, and I started to see other people moving up really quickly. And you know, they were, they were becoming professors, they were becoming readers much, much earlier than I was. And I felt that I was, um, I, I was um, lagging behind. Um, then, um, in I think it was 20, 2011, moved back to the law school in Birkbeck, and I was offered an opportunity. Um, to think about whether I'd like to uh, work in, uh, in in a more managerial or leadership leaderly position, and I worked um, and I, and I worked developed a pro vice master role because Birkbeck has a master uh, for academic and community partnerships, which was something I was very passionate about, and developed that over a period of about five years. I got very frustrated. I think one of the things about leadership and people who go into management and leadership positions, and I think Duncan averts this, you know, um, fleas on fleas. And maybe Fiona feels the same, is that it, it's living with and managing frustration, uh, that you're constantly feeling that if only you had more resources, if only you had more people, if only there was more time, if only the institution was like this, if only the world was different. And I think the thing that I've learned over the last, well, it's getting on for 35 years now, is that it isn't like that. And you have to be somebody who's comfortable in that very frustrating space and to make the most of it and to retain as positive an out, uh, outlook as you can. So I moved through all of those. So I've worked in six very different universities and that's been one of the greatest pleasures. I, Fiona is absolutely right. I don't think you do have to move. Um, I think you can have a brilliant career staying where you are, but I, from my own experience, and this was, I'm quite happy to accept it. Um, I was somebody who really, um, I, I don't have caring responsibilities. I don't have children. Um, that makes a huge difference. I think, you know, people's experience are very different. That's a very important thing as well. Um, I think for some people, it's easier to take on these roles and to anticipate them because of their own personal and domestic circumstances. And I'm, and I'm passionate um, about uh, something which I think is very difficult for universities to um, contemplate in some cases, which is about role sharing in senior positions in order to maximise the number of people who can't take on the whole responsibility um, but might might have some skills where they could do two and a half days a week or it's on a fractional basis. Uh, I think this is something that we as a sector really need to start embracing and thinking very carefully about how the diversity in the senior leadership level, which is, I mean, look at us, um, we're all white, I think, on this, on this call. Um, Fiona is a woman, but the rest of us are men. And this is probably pretty typical if you look at the senior leadership across many universities. We're probably typical, but it's, but it's not helped by the way in which senior leadership roles, I think in some ways are constructed and the expectations of them. That's something we might want to discuss in the, in the, in the chat later. Um, my, my usual day, my usual day starts, um, I get up very, very, very early. I write fiction. I always write at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, if I don't write at five o'clock, I'd never have any time to do it. So you have to be somebody who has, who has the capacity to get up at that. And then I go to the gym at six o'clock. So I have to go to the gym because if I don't do some exercise, my brain atrophies and I need to get the blood flowing. And then my first meeting is usually informally or, or catching up at 7, 7.15, 7.30. And I usually don't finish my working day to day. It finishes at nine. My next meeting after this finishes at nine o'clock tonight. And I know we're in very exceptional times, 
but it is pretty pretty standard uh, that the work day is 10 hours and there is always a day or half a day at the weekend. So you have to be somebody who is willing and able to kind of contemplate uh, that level that level of work and um, and maintain the, the energy levels for that. Um, what do I do? I'm, I'm involved in lots of stuff. I deputise for vice chancellor. There's only one deputy vice chancellor at Hertfordshire. He's very outward facing in much of his work. So he's doing the policy work. He's working with the Alliance. He's working with the UK. He's talking to the ministers. He's doing that kind of work um, and higher level board um, stuff. And my responsibility, my job description is basically my job is to is to deliver the university's academic content uh, and deliver the strategic plan over the next five years. So it's not much. Uh, it, it's huge. <laughs> uh, Hertfordshire is a big university. It's not as big as some, but it's a fairly big university. And so that's what I do. I deputise for him. Um, we've been having gold meetings uh, three times a week, managing the COVID uh, issues. So we meet at eight thirty every um, three times a week. Um, I help the registrar write communications three or four times a week, which go out. We do that every day. I chair the promotions panel for professors, associate professors, readers. Um, I chair all the strategic planning meetings and I'm responsible for that. I'm responsible for the strategic plan and, and those budget meetings. Um, I'm responsible for the portfolio review of the entire university. I line manage eight deans in eight schools and the PVCs, two of the three PVCs. Um, I have to approve capital expenditure over a million quid. Um, I attend, I'm a director of three subsidiaries of the university. So I have board meetings very regularly. On that, we have a bus company, we have a ventures company, um, and, and those kind of things. Um, so that's it's very, very, very diverse. And I think the reason why I love it is very similar to what Duncan said. I think the first thing is you have to love higher education and not just law. You have to be passionate about its potential to transform lives. And you have to get up in the morning thinking you can make a difference. You might not make a difference. Uh, it might be one of those days where actually you make very little difference. Um, but you have to believe that what you're doing can make a difference at an institutional and at a personal level. You have to put yourself out. I think you have to be other regarding as a leader. I think you have to be somebody who's mindful of the people you're working with and their perspectives, but at the same time have a very clear steer in your own mind. I think going back to what Duncan said about what may, why might lawyers be, be going into senior management? And I think it's interesting that um, when I had went to Portsmouth as executive dean. It's the only time I've ever had to do a psychometric evaluation for a job. And I did it in a hotel room in Oslo because I was speaking at a conference and you have one hour to finish this thing, you know, and, and otherwise it pushes you out and you're not allowed to go back and check your answers. And when I spoke to the occupational psychologist on the debrief afterwards, it was very interesting because they said that I was somebody who had equally strong answers on evidence-based decision making and strong values and I think that was really interesting I think many lawyers are evidence-based in their decisions they like to know why somebody might be presenting an argument to them and what's the evidence for that why do you want to do that what is why should we change where we are what is the state why why do we move from the status quo into a different position um, but at the same time um, I think we're wrong. If you go back to what's it called, Legally Blonde, and that wonderful scene at the beginning where that fantastic lecturer, that professor is chalking on the board, if, any, if anybody's seen the, the film. And she writes, um, uh, law is reason free from passion. Who said that? Right. And Aristotle's the answer. Right. But I think that's wrong. I think law is not reason free from passion. I think uh, law is reason where you understand what the impact of passion can be. And if we don't have passion, in fact, then there's very little, it just becomes a technocratic exercise. So I think you have to be somebody with a very strong sense of values, a passion about higher education. Um, I, I've had this brilliant experience, like Duncan, like Fiona, of coming from law, but then be exposed as a socio-legal studies scholar. I was always working in my research with people from different disciplines, from politics, from sociology, from epidemiology, virology, public health, medicine, uh, the whole gamut. And then having this wonderful opportunity to work with sociologists, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a professional way, I found that incredibly exciting and um, in a, a real privilege, actually, to have access to those. And as Duncan said, you know, we had um, you know, police degree apprenticeships, we had probation contracts with the Ministry of Justice, we had 
um, professionally accredited language courses, teaching English as a foreign. I mean, I did so much that I knew about peripherally and I learned a great deal about, and that feels like a great privilege. And if you are a fascinated person and you want to learn more, then, then it's brilliant. Uh, keep as fit as possible, you know, that's really important. I mean, you have to kind of, I think, try and recognize it's very tiring, it's exhausting. Um, and you have to constantly mind yourself and look after yourself first. You're no good to anybody in a leadership or management position if you're not feeling uh, at, on top form. Um, and the other thing I think which we haven't talked about, it's very lonely, right? This is, you know, if we're going to be frank about it, it can be very lonely. The higher you go up this conventional pyramid, um, when I was a lecturer, the thing I absolutely loved was going down the pub, going down to the bar, going to a cafe with all my lecturer friends and going, yeah, 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 the head of department, yeah, 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 school, university management, doing all the things that bond you. And you can have those friends and you can talk frankly with your peer group. As that peer group gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, so that when you're a dean, you've got, in Portsmouth, I had four other deans. They were the people I could talk to because we shared the same experience. Then when I became deputy vice chancellor, it's just me. You know, that's that's quite a place to be. The secretary and registrar at our university who has the same kind of position as me at the professional services level is my immediate kind of you know professional service colleague. And like Duncan, I absolutely say the biggest no-no is disrespectful or, or not treating professional colleagues with the respect that they deserve because um, our universities are integrated institutions and nothing would happen without their passion as well. Um, Reflect on your resilience. You have to be somebody who can, at the one time, and I don't know how to describe this, but I've had some very, very challenging conversations and had to, had to give very challenging talks in my, in my professional career. And you have to remember that in some, in some contexts you are in role and it's the Dean speaking, or it's the Pro Vice Chancellor speaking, or it's the Deputy Vice Chancellor speaking. And in other contexts, it's Matthew, but the, the role is always occupied by Matthew or Duncan or Fiona or anybody else occupying these roles. And they will bring their unique, um, empathetic or, or, or particular values and, and concerns to that role. But you have to be able to move in and out of those and also to find a way of integrating them so that you don't kind of fracture at the edges. I think you have to be true to yourself and you have to um, recognise that if you're successful when you apply for these jobs, the reason you've been successful is because somebody somewhere or a group of people saw that in you, you might have the qualities that that role, um, that, that role uh, needs. I'm going to finish just now with a couple of things since people have been finishing with um, anecdotes. First of all, learn about accounts, understand the money. Where does the money come from and where does the money go and how is it distributed? I think as law, we, we, this is the biggest learning curve I had was understanding uh, accounts. And it was fascinating and illuminating and terribly important uh, for me to, to, to get my head around that. Um, there is a difference between leadership and management. Um, you know, don't think that one equates with the other. Management is the line management, you know, the kind of this, that and the other and getting things stuff. And leadership is about character, about values, about um, strategic thinking and, and you need to think when you're when you're moving into this which of these things do I want which things am I comfortable with um, then um, be kind always be kind try and be as kind as you possibly can even in those difficult situations um, remember that when people come to you I sometimes forget maybe Fiona and Duncan will reflect on this too is that I am still Matthew from 35 years ago as the research assistant at the, you know, in my first job. If I, if I email somebody now, or if I press on a Teams thing call, people pick up within about a nanosecond or Matthew's ringing. You know, I forget that other people perceive me in, in my role when I call. And I think you have to remember that with that comes great responsibility and you have to be very thoughtful about the impact that your role may have on other people. Um, I did a leadership course online recently, and this is what I'll finish with, which because they made me laugh. Um, and it was a Harvard um, Kennedy School online leadership course. It was absolutely terrible, I have to say, um, but I did it. Um, and the two bits of uh, sort of nuggets um, about leadership, I think they were tongue in cheek at the beginning, were a successful leadership involves developing in people the capacity for despair 
<laughs> that was one thing. And then the other one was um, disappointing people at a rate they can tolerate. Um, I thought these were very pessimistic and rather, um, maybe they were East Coast, and maybe they were ironic, and maybe they were kind of Boston, Harvard, let's have a little bit of a joke. I can't, I couldn't disagree more with that. I think if you if you want to go into leadership and you're coming from a research or teaching or, or hybrid career, then it has amazing opportunities to allow yourself and other people to flourish. If you're passionate about your institution, if you're passionate about people, if you're not afraid of frustration and that things take twice as long, always, as what you as you would hope, then uh, it, it might be something that you want to explore and get a mentor. You know, find somebody who early on in your career might be willing to be a confidant uh, with you. I think most people in senior roles are more than happy if they've got the capacity to take on people to share with them their aspirations in a confidential basis and, and to explore with them their aspirations and to challenge them in a in a safe environment. And I found that um, both having been mentored and um, now I'm sponsoring in the Advanced HE Diversifying Leadership Programme with a with a, a, um, a black colleague at, at the university. And that has been wonderful for me. I've been challenged by, by them and um, I've learned a great deal. Always be willing to learn. And that's it. I've got nothing else to say. Matthew, thank you very, very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed to Matthew, to Duncan, and also to Fiona for those very, very wise words and good advice. There are some questions which are in the Q&A bar, and we're now going to move to Carl, who's going to moderate all of those questions and ask them. I've got a lot of questions that I'd like to ask, but um, I can probably catch the, the speakers after this particular event. But just on behalf of me, thank you very much indeed, folks. Thank you. Over to you, Carl. And thank you all for a really fabulous uh, introduction to our to our series. Um, the first question, and I, I'm going to use the, the chair's prerogative to ask some questions that my colleagues and I have discussed in advance, uh, which is really to all of you. And that goes to um, to share your insights in that you're you're in a unique position in that you come from the discipline of law, you now see um, promotion cases across the university, and you also see promotion cases that come up through your own discipline of law. And whether you can offer any advice uh, to legal academics around how they uh, position and indeed promote themselves when they have to uh, essentially sell themselves to across the university and to those with no, uh, possibly no real understanding of the discipline. And uh, <clears throat> I leave it to all of you to comment on that. Okay, so shall I kick off? Sure. I'm sure everyone will have thoughts about this. Um, I, th I think as with promotion, um, with impact um, cases, with grant applications, there's just something about being able to get beyond jargon and explain not just what it is you're going to do or what it is you have done, but to explain why it's important and not assume that other people understand what's important in the world that you occupy. So it is about being able to translate. Um, you know, we, um, you know, you talked about being in that translator role. Um, and I think that's very often where um, a promotion case is, is kind of made or, or, or lost, is the, the ability of the individual and the, and the person supporting them to really translate into the language of the panel, and they will have their language, um, why it is so important that this contribution that you've made is um, recognised through the promotion. And, and I think the other thing about promotion panels is to remember that, you know, we <coughs> You know, university is nothing without its staff. The staff's, you know, the most important element. It is this. It is the biggest single investment. Um, 
when you follow the money, you know, the biggest single investment is in staff. So if someone is in front of you asking to be promoted, they're asking for a major investment to be made into their career and their, their position. And um, if you're on, if you're on the, the panel, what you want to know is what's going to be the return on that investment. So what is going to be the really important contribution that that person is going to make in the future? And of course, the panel is interested not in the next big monograph or journal article per se, but what does that do for the university? If we use the university money to promote you, what does the university get back? So they're interested in your reputation, your standing, um, you know, how, what, where's the evidence that that is being recognized externally? Any other comments? And I'd also welcome any thoughts in answering this about the culture of metrics um, and how you how you manage that in looking at um, individuals. Can I can I just pop in on this? Yeah. Um, uh, I think Fiona makes some really good points. I think one of the things that I found most interesting, um, just on on the specific publication issue, because I think there's one other point I'd like to make. One of the things I found most exciting about being a, an interdisciplinary, um, working in an interdisciplinary environment was reading STEM colleagues' work. And one of the reasons that I, I enjoyed it was if you ever go in, and I'm sure many of you have gone into a fairly standard STEM journal, it's unbelievably rigorous in its formatting. Lawyers are quite often far less rigorous in the way that they present their work, it goes into grant applications and into publications as well. I don't think we generally explain our method particularly clearly and why we're choosing this method and why it's appropriate. So that goes to, and this is a bit refy, isn't it? Um, but we don't articulate right up front why it's original, why it's different from what other people have been doing. And I don't think we are particularly good necessarily at articulating significance. And sometimes when you look at those STEM journals, you can see why they're very successful in applying for, for grants because it's they've got in their head a kind of the kind of hard wire. You do this, you do this, you do this, and you end up with the discussion and the limitations, and it's all there. I think sometimes as lawyers, we could we could benefit sometimes from at least understanding that kind of method and at least responding or reflecting on whether that could work could help us in our work. The other thing I would say in terms of promotions, um, Carl, is and I never did this. So I put my hand up. I think read the university strategy, read, read the values, understand the mission and align yourself in your narrative, your own professional narrative to those, because I think it's a softer version, perhaps, of what Fiona's saying, is what, what will your contribution be to the delivery of this university's future? And if you're able to look at some of those values and ambitions and strategic objectives and KPIs and to say, oh, yeah, OK, one of their key board level objectives is that I do that. I do that. And this is how I do that. Um, then those things cease to be disciplinary and criticizable in the way that many of us might wish to in a kind of you know, neoliberal critique, but actually as frameworks on which to hang some of the things that we actually feel quite passionate about. Um, because it's quite often the case that those metrics and those KPIs that the university sets or or within a school are ones where you unpick them. You think, well, actually, I can't really disagree with that. <laughs> you know, that, that on its own is something where why, why wouldn't we want to do that? Why wouldn't we want to deliver this? Um, and I think that's quite good, um, quite a good strategy and to do it in a very explicit way and not to. I think quite often we hide our lights under bushels. We know this is the case among many female colleagues who are applying and, you know, that, that, you know, we see it all the time in all of the research, not selling oneself, you know, feeling slightly, it's a bit too brash um, to, to actually make claims because I think sometimes some of the male, I, I, this is a personal observation, some male colleagues seem to me to be much less wary of blowing their own trumpets and quite a lot of applications I've seen from female colleagues, stress collaboration, the support they've provided to other colleagues, uh, the collegiality, these are all very, very valuable things. Um, and, you know, if you've got a good panel, which might include me, 
I'm, mind, you know, I'm quite mindful of how it is that sometimes people's professional careers and the way they use language can, can affect it, but always get other people to read it and you know, see whether or not you're selling yourself well enough and pulling out the strong stuff. Yeah, it's one of my... So I've, I've got very little to add other than I think, um, obviously different universities have different processes and certainly some universities would, in, particularly if you're a faculty of law, you may have the SL, possibly the reader, but certainly the SL as an internal promotion process. And then it's only when you get to the reader and professor where you would get possibly oversight by a more broader team other universities it would be right from any kind of promotion you'd be subject to that sort of uh, review by a much wider team and I think certainly my experiences as lawyers we don't we undersell ourselves and we expect others to understand us better than we probably do and that the probably the crux of that is in recent years of course has been about uh, the money finance uh, you know applications for research grants and, you know, I'm doing a good job. I'm producing these articles with very little regard to what the promotion criteria might be around uh, the importance of research grant capture. And certainly other disciplines, whether they're successful or not, seem to get that much more than lawyers have. Now, that's an overgeneralization, which is probably unfair, but certainly it is my sense that uh, lawyers don't pay as much regard, which is ironic, saying we do meant to, you know, read the rules about, you know, if it says, have you applied for research grant capture, don't leave the box empty. You know, it's as simple as that sometimes. Okay. I'm going to turn to questions that are coming in from our, from our audience. Uh, this, the first question refers back to a comment that Fiona made, which is about taking on leadership roles and the choice as to, um, and I'll paraphrase slightly, uh, between uh, leadership roles within your own, within your own discipline versus more broad, broadly across, say, a faculty or university wide. Uh, and uh, I suppose the I, I suspect uh, the react response is going to be it's not an either or. Uh, but um, do you have any advice as to how to strike that balance from, from anyone? Fiona, as it, uh, this came out of your presentation, maybe you'd like to respond. Thank you, Carl. I think you're right. I think it's, it's, it's rarely going to be an, an either or, but of course, at some points in your career, it is an either or, isn't it? Sometimes you, you, you're being asked to, to choose or you've got opportunities and um, you, 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 you have to kind of decide which way you want to go. Um, I think I would go back to, to say, get that wide range of experiences. So if you think that you've already, you know, had a couple of major leadership roles in your own discipline area mm -hmm. or very close to your own discipline area, then, you know, maybe be thinking about um, how you can broaden your experience. On the other hand, if you feel you've um, done a lot of different little things, but you haven't had a major leadership role in your own area, then you might, you know, you might want to try to kind of, think, well, if I really take that role on, is that somewhere where I can make a big difference um, and, and move move the department, move the school forward, um, whatever it is. So um, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule. Um, I, I think the question is, is kind of perhaps suggesting that you could lose visibility um, in your own school. And, and I think this is a really important question. It's a really important question sometimes for people who are, you know, going off on fellowships, maybe kind of have a lot of the time taken up with research grants um, or anything else that takes you away from the day-to-day -day contact with colleagues. And one piece of advice I think I've often given colleagues is, you know, this is a, your, your home department, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like home, you know, there is an analogy. If you don't keep your relationships strong at home, then everything else is going to fall in on you someday. Um, so I think you do. I think you do need to find ways to kind of check in with the colleagues. You, you perhaps can't go to all the staff meetings. You per perhaps won't see them as often as you used to because you're doing another role and it's taking you in a different direction. But remember where home is because one day you'll want to go back there, um, and you don't want to find that it, it's that's just not feasible. I want to follow up with uh, 
to to that answer with a with a follow up question. And uh, this also goes back to promotions and career tracks. All of you, I think, described uh, in a way you described yourselves and your careers as I think is very much as all rounders. And I think most legal academics, um, certainly of uh, of a particular, have been around for for a while, would describe themselves in those terms. To what extent do you think that all rounder type of uh, package of activities is is perhaps being undervalued in a world in which uh, there's an expectation of either being a research superstar or being on a more of a teaching route and and is there is there still a, a way and indeed how does one sell oneself as being on that all rounder trajectory? Well, I'll kick off. I think it, it is challenging. And I think to some extent, if you are connecting, doing these things with progression and promotion, to some extent, it will depend upon whether citizenship is included within the uh, promotion criteria. And certainly, my sense is that it's very variable across the sector to what extent citizenship is properly rewarded. And to build on Fiona's previous point, often, if it is, it's in relation to what goes on within your own school. It's not necessarily about citizenship elsewhere in the university. Um, I found that a lot of the things, and I suppose it goes back to something Matthew said, it, a lot of it just basically was more work and it was basically just extending the day and made it even busier than it was. It wasn't necessarily uh, being substituted for other things. So it was just extending the day and it's, it's not always a great role model in terms of having to work long days and then weekends, etc. But certainly that has been my experience over the, over the years in terms of being able to fit everything in if you take on these additional responsibilities. Yeah, I think, I think Duncan makes a really good point there, Carl. I, I, one of the things that I believe quite strongly in, because I've, I've seen it work for people, is very early on, or as early as people feel comfortable, if they are interested in promotion to an associate professor or reader or um, a professorial position, is to get the criteria, put them down the left-hand side of an Excel spreadsheet and start filling it in with what you do and concentrate on where the gaps are. Um, you know, it's a bit like revising, I remember at, for A-levels, is, is it's very tempting to revise the things you know I think you have to work out that there are some things you can probably bank because you've got the evidence. And then there are some things which are other, sometimes quite frightening to confront because you can see that there are gaps. And you think, oh, you know, how, how am I going to manage that? Well, that gives you can give you quite a good guide as to where you can then go to a line manager or a head of department or, or to somebody and be proactive and say, are there any opportunities for me to undertake X because you've identified it as something that might potentially be, be a gap? Um, and it's part of the part of the published criteria for for, for promotion. Um, so I think taking a relatively strategic and slightly forensic approach to it, uh, which doesn't always feel right, um, can be helpful. And also anticipating, if you can, I think one of the challenges being an academic um, right from the early stages that we live. I think one of the most distinctive things about an academic career is that we're constantly we're living in a space where there are almost infinite horizons before us. There's what are we doing at 12 o'clock this afternoon, next week, next term, next year. <laughs> and we're managing those in the present. And that can be very anxiety making. And I think that sometimes thinking, OK, would it be reasonable for me to be um, uh, an associate professor or to go for that grade up in three years time? If it's three years time and I can think about that, work it backwards. What, would I, what might I need to have done in two years and in one year? And to and be fairly strategic. It can relax you, actually, having a plan and thinking about it and thinking about that about that framework. That's what I'd say. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, that dovetails nicely uh, to a tension that's in a comment also in the chat box, uh, in the Q&A box, which is that it's good to hear that not having a game plan is okay. So this <laughs> clearly... Um, 
I think what I meant by that was around that wasn't about professorial promotion. Yeah. I was thinking about leadership stuff, which I think can be slightly rather di can be rather yeah. different. Okay. Those, those are rather different. Thanks approach. for clarifying that. Uh, another comment, uh, which appreciates the really interesting insights from all of you, uh, but wonders how you sustain momentum and balance, if at all, work pressures with home life pressures. I don't know who, I mean, Matthew, this was, uh, you really uh, put out there what kind of uh, working hours uh, you face. And uh, you've talked a little bit about how you uh, try to maintain balance, but. Yeah, yeah um, uh, it's very, very important. I, I mean, I think I really love work, that helps. So in a sense, the work-life balance thing for me is if, if I didn't enjoy and love and feel passionate about my work, I don't think I'd be doing this job. I wouldn't have applied for it. I knew what it would entail. Um, and that's a choice. Um, it, you know, if it were to cease to be, you know, something that I, I loved as much, I wouldn't do it. In terms of the work life, it is very important to, I have, I have lots of other passions um, that I pursue. Um, but it is, but it does get, it does get harder, I think. I think it does get harder, and, and I, you know, Duncan and, and Fiona probably have different views. So again, I'm I'm very I'm fortunate in the fact that I don't have, in that sense, I don't have carer responsibilities, and my domestic circumstances are such that I have more time when I'm not at work to be able to relax rather than feel like I'm looking after other people outside work. So that's a personal experience which I know has benefited me. I'm very open about that. I think that's right. I wonder if there are any other uh, comments or advice about um, maintaining that work life, trying to maintain or how you can maintain um, balance and momentum. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one. Um, so when Matthew said, you know, that um, it's 10 hour days, I kind of railed a little bit and thought, no, 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 it mustn't be 10 hour days. It can't be 10 hour days. If, if a colleague told us we were, they were working 10 hours a day, we'd tell them to stop and get a better work life balance. And then I thought, you know what, I'm doing this from home and I wonder what they think, you know, elsewhere in the house. Um, I don't think I can claim, honestly, that I didn't ever do 10 hour days. Um, but I think um, I certainly haven't always done 10 hour days. Um, and um, and I wouldn't recommend it. I think you have to know your limits. I think you have to know um, when to check out and when to spend time with your family. Um, it, you know, a role like this, obviously, you will sometimes be checking your phone through the evening because there are things going on and over the weekend, but you know, you do have to find a way to give proper attention to the other things that need proper attention. And I think probably two things that, that really help. Um, one is knowing that um, you've got a kind of strong team, you're part of a strong team and that things at the end of the day, you know, the sky isn't gonna fall down if you don't pick something up because other people are gonna pick it up as well. Um, and you know, I think think team team is really really important. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, and again, it's kind of slightly strange in these times to be saying this, but you know, academics are not very good at taking leave. Um, but you really need to take leave, and you know, everybody needs to take leave, and um, we need to encourage others to take leave and really step away. You get such a good kind of refresh and you know a sense of perspective when you properly get away from the job for a block of time um and again you know leaving the job with someone else while, while you do that um so you know I, th I think we should really worry about this um because you know there was a comment about the diversity on the panel at the beginning we need to make it possible for many different people in many different circumstances to take on roles like this, um, not to feel like they're squeezing um, their family time, um, their other interests, their leisure time in order to, to be able to deliver the job. So, you know, we have to have a serious conversation about how to make it work. Um, and I think we all have that responsibility to, to try to do that. Okay. <clears throat> Duncan? Um, I don't think there's an awful lot to add. Um, the job is busy, uh, but equally, I'm, I'm just reflecting. I think being head of school 
was as challenging, if not more challenging in, a, in different ways and probably as long in terms of, because I was still doing the teaching, I was still doing the marking, uh, you know, there was, I think, it's, there is a there is a fallacy to suggest that actually the higher up the tree you go, the, the harder, the longer you work, etc. Because uh, certainly during COVID, uh, my heads have been working as hard, if not harder than me. Uh, and I've been very conscious of that in terms of the way that I've supported them. I like Matthew have been on some rather crazy leadership courses over the years. And one was, I got asked, you know, what keeps you awake at night? Which is a slightly variation on a theme. For me, it's not the big thematic, strategic, programmatic things. Uh, it's the the one to one challenges. It's the conversations, the improving performance conversations, possibly the dismissal conversations. You know, so for me, it's it's possibly the the quality of the issues that you've had rather than the quantity that sometimes is the more challenging. It's you know, it may be a shorter day, but there may be the nature of the issues you're having to deal with that are part of the challenge. Okay. Um, it, there's a very interesting uh, point, which is about uh, while well, our uh, question uh, ask, uh, the person asking a question uh, states, I completely accept the inevitability of university leaders having to shed teaching and research in order to balance workload. How do you remember what it's like for your more junior colleagues? Um, I could, I constantly see poor communication caused by fundamental misunderstandings of motives and circumstances on both sides. So, uh, I guess kind of, how do you, how do you remember, uh, what it's like for someone who, uh, has that other set of demands? Well, my colleagues are not shy in coming forward, I have to say. So mm -hmm. even if I was to forget, I'd be told and reminded on a quite a regular basis. So, And that's one of the reasons, like I did that Q&A today. It's really important both to you know continue to listen, to hear. And I suppose the interesting challenge from this position is how to do that without being seen to intervene within or between a head of school and their school, uh, because actually they've got to manage their own areas. But you've got to also have a sense when the VC asks the question as what's going on in X, you, you normally got to have an answer relatively quickly. So uh, for me, I, it's finding that balance without intervening in the internal affairs of a school that is quite an interesting conundrum. When I was, uh, when I was the de Executive Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at Portsmouth, the first thing I did was instituted a weekly um, kind of bring a Sani lunch um, in my office for all people who were appointed in, in year and, and the year before. Uh, on a, so about six people came and sat around a table and we just had lunch and I just talked to them about their experiences. And then that was very important for me to understand and also for them to introduce each other. I think another, another problem as you move further up or another challenge as, as you move up this pyramid, especially if you have a number of departments or, or schools or faculties below you, is you kind of assume everybody knows everybody else because you know everybody, or you know who everybody is, but actually you're the, you, you, you're the spider at the center of a web sometimes, and people on other opposite ends of the web have never met each other. I found you know, people who start, have been teaching history and people who've been teaching sociology at the university for five years, they've never met. So there were, there were opportunities to, to, to bring people together in that way, and I found that extremely useful. I think you've got to get out there. I think you've got to be visible. I think you've got to get out of your office and you've got to walk around. It's been harder, obviously, over the last six months. I started my job at Hertfordshire 10 days before the lockdown. So I had 10 days to meet people in the flesh. Uh, and that was, and then everything I've been doing since then has been in this little garden shed, um, other than the days I've gone up because I've had to. But you can, I think my, my experience was, is, is be as open as you possibly can be and be as present and visible as you possibly can be and take an active interest in what people are doing. I love reading my colleagues work. I, I quite often go into the you know, university uh, online library and I choose an article from an entirely, uh, you know, an area of the university I might not know about astrophysics or something that looks as that, you know, something I might be able to read. And then I get in touch with the person and I just say, I read your article and I thought that was interesting. That's quite nice. You can't do it for everybody because you've got 1800 staff. You know, so, but you can, you can make an active attempt to 
learn about what people are doing and to show an active interest. And that goes a long way, actually. And saying thank you, oh my goodness me, when anybody does anything that, that you notice, always write and say thank you. Always make the effort. It doesn't take very much. Two lines means a great, you know, it, it can be it can mean a great deal actually. And and to say, you know, if I'd love to hear more about your work if you've got time, I'd love to catch up with a coffee if the time is there. And sometimes the offer is enough. Sometimes, you know, it might not be easy to take it up, but yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, a couple more questions as time is short. Uh, question, how do you cope with professional jealousy? Now, I and then the author makes clear that it's others' jealousy of you rather than your own professional jealousy uh, and the way in which it, that can affect projects, departments, schools. Or maybe you're not even aware of it. I think most of the people I know think I'm kind of nuts for doing this. I mean, people I've known over the years, rather than jealous. <laughs> I, I don't think, I mean, there may be, there may be people who are jealous, but um, mostly jealousy is something that people keep to themselves. So I, they probably wouldn't tell me. Okay. Um, I suppose I had an interest in, uh, so I went from being one of the heads of school to pro vice chancellor. So I went from being a peer to essentially their boss overnight uh so uh that was an interesting transition um fortunately the vc gave me a mini sabbatical of a couple of months which basically meant i could disappear and then come back almost in a different guise uh, it, it's 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 basically all those things we've been talking about i pretending not to be somebody else you know that everybody realizes it's the same uh character i'm obviously playing a different role i uh, obviously have to have sometimes difficult conversations but not trying to uh you know put on airs and graces because i'm now in a, a role above them because they would of course remembered me when i was being the the annoying peer in all those uh meetings which we were having only a few months before uh but it, it did take some thinking through and managing moving internally upwards certainly Um, I'm going to turn to a final question now, and this is regarding the point about long hours. Uh, and the question is, how can university managers uh, create the conditions where colleagues don't have to work those kinds of long hours? And I suppose the, the uh, implicit in the question is creating those conditions of not having to work long hours if you're prepared to do them. Mm. So I sent out uh, an email just last Friday, basically telling all my college that they, as far as possible, not to work the weekend, to take it at break time, you know, that they've been working amazingly hard. Um, if they'd actually known that I'd then carried on for several hours later that evening over the weekend, I'd probably not been a great role model, but I'd certainly set the, uh, the message out that I didn't really want them to be answering emails. I'm not sure there's an awful, you know, there's a whole systemic issues which we need to tackle. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's a wider conversation, I think. Okay, any other final, any final comments then uh, from any of you? Okay. Well, I, mean, I, I guess yeah. just one, Carl, which is that, um, you know, we focused, I suppose, quite a lot on some of the challenges um, and, and maybe said, less about you know the the good points the, the kind of joys in these roles and I think you know you're, you're looking at three people who look pretty happy in their roles um, and I think that's something that we should acknowledge that um, being in a being in a major leadership role can be very fulfilling and very stimulating um, very exciting you get an enormous sense of privilege sometimes in terms of some of the some of the you know, kind of um, um, events that you find yourself in the the kind of it really inspiring work from colleagues that that you you hear about and so on so um you know it, it's it's um it, it's a role that brings um a lot of fulfillment um and and i guess that's part of why that that's part of why we do it as well uh final final thought from uh from you duncan uh, no, I agree. Uh, sometimes they are nuggets in terms of that uh, level of enjoyment. But, uh, you know, once you stop uh, smiling and laughing 
and sort of enjoying the job, then it's probably the time to think about, you know, what else should I be doing? And Matthew? Um, no, I think Fiona and Duncan have summed it up, um, have summed it up pretty well. I think you, I think it, it comes down ultimately to remembering that, you know, what, at whatever level you're doing it, and if you're from a module leader at, as, a, as a lecturer, you're doing a leadership role, you're leading in, in, in that role, and we're always practising, and everybody is doing it, it's just whether or not that bit of doing it is the bit that gets your pulse racing sometimes about whether you move from the actual substance of the module to the idea of what it is to lead a module. Um, and then that's everything follows on from that, I think. Great. Well, I think that's a, a great place to, to end. And that does bring us to the end of tonight's workshop, uh, which uh, has been, I think, a fantastic launch mm. to our, our Charles Isles series on academic career development. So I'd like to thank our guests for a really fascinating and informative wide ranging workshop. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dev for chairing tonight's proceedings. And finally, I want to thank our audience for, for their contribution. And I hope that you will join us again for our next workshop, which will be on Wednesday, the 11th of November at 1700 GMT. Further details and the registration process can be found on the IELTS website. Uh, but in the meantime, it's good night from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Good night. <laughs>